This is Public Resource. The Internet Code Improvement Commission. This is Carl Malamud. Uh, Today we're talking with David Halperin. He is the co-founder of the American Constitution Society, a former senior government official, and is of Council to Public Resource. Uh, Welcome, David. Carl, thank you for having me. I'd like to talk about the law, and I understand you're my lawyer, so this is not a privileged conversation since we're going to be posting it on the net. Um, But I thought we would discuss some of the finer points, uh, beginning with the edicts of government doctrine. Um, What does that say? Edicts of government doctrine is a rule about copyright law. It says that the law can't be copyrighted because the people are the owners of the law. And so if something is the law, that means that if you if if one person speaks it, someone else can't come in and say you can't speak it because I have a copyright and you didn't get my permission. Now, in the case of Georgia versus public resource that involved you posting the law of Georgia online, the Supreme Court uh, in 2020 took it a step further and said that materials that lack the force of law but that are issued by the legislature in the course of their legislative duties are also subject to that edicts of government uh, rule. So that that rule, it's not a new one, is it? Um, Weren't they just reinforcing existing case law? It's, It's not a radical departure? Not a radical departure, but somewhat of an extension because the issue was the the official code of Georgia contained both the legislative law of Georgia that had been passed by the legislature and a series of other things, including annotations where various experts that were uh, under the auspices of the Georgia Code Commission, but also working with a private company, create annotations explaining what the provisions of law mean. Now, that was all bundled together in a book, as you know, called the Official Code of Georgia. So in the case, the issue was, yes, the, the other side, the state of Georgia, had to agree that, yes, the law can't be copyrighted. And they did put a light version of the code, minus all of these additional uh, things like the annotations online. That is free, although not a very elegant or usable version of it. But the official code of Georgia, which was in, uh, a, something that is a thing in Georgia law, that all Georgia laws amend the official code of Georgia, that was all bundled in the book with the annotation. So what they were fighting about was saying, since we glued in other things that are uh, not do not have the full force of law, that therefore this whole book can be protected and copyrighted and the public can only have the light version unless they pay for it. And they cannot share the full version as you did by putting it online uh, because you don't have permission to do so. What the Supreme Court therefore said was, sorry, it's not even that it all was all bundled in one book. Even if they put the annotations in a separate volume, because they were issued by an official body, the legislature's code commission, um, they have they are they are subject to the same rule, the edicts of government doctrine, which means not that they can't sell the book, not that people wouldn't buy the book. But if you buy the book, you have bought a book that is entirely consisting of edicts of government. And therefore, you have the right to post the book and Georgia cannot sue you to for damages or to take down the book, claiming that they have a legitimate copyright in the volume. So the core question is under whose name is it issued, right? I think what the Supreme Court asked our lawyer is, how can you tell? We, we sort of know what the law is, but how do you know it's, it's, it's legal materials? How can you tell? Is this like pornography, right? You, you know it when you see it? Is it that kind of test? How can you tell? Well, that's what we have another case pending in the district court in Washington that was about edicts of government. In this case, it's about materials incorporated by reference. We posted online all these materials that are published under the auspices of private nonprofit groups, although they include when they create these technical standards um, on various topics such as uh, building codes, uh, food safety, et cetera, educational testing, that, that all of these things are uh, they, they are issued in the private organization, but then they're incorporated by affirmative actions of either a legislature or a regulatory agency saying 
this private standard is now the law. It's part of the law. And those things, as you know, you purchase because they are the law. You put them online. And we, we got sued in 2013 for that. And a judge, a district judge said, no, you, we can't do that. Those are copyrighted materials. Tough luck. But went up to the uh, Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals did create a kind of a test. They said all of these things that Carl posted, let's let's ask the district court to kind of look at them uh, as categories. Some things look more law like than other and some things um, don't. Some things are seem less like law and more like just verbiage or, or something else. And that's what the district court was tasked with doing, was sorting through this. I think that the decision in the Georgia case, as we did argue back to the court after the Georgia case was issued, renders that whole task uh, uh, not moot, but it, but no longer valid. It's not whether the language is lawlike. It's whether it is issued under the auspices of a, a government body in the course of their government duties. And in their course of their maybe law giving duties, we've talked about things like a map. The National Park Service wants to sell maps of a park. Maybe that is not a law function. That's more just like an administrative or a helpful function. And in that case, if you took all the maps and put them online, I guess it's possible that you could be sued for copyright infringement. The government could have some copyright interest, but not in things that are related to their delivering of the law. And in, in certainly the case of Georgia, the things are bundled together. So we can tease that apart. If a judge writes the model jury instructions, that is the law and legal materials, even if the jury instructions don't have the force of law, but it explains the law and it was written by a judge. That's an edict. Um, if a K Street lobbyist uh, writes a bill and it becomes law, that's an edict. Uh, it doesn't matter who wrote it. It was issued by the United States Congress. That's the test. Law and legal materials issued in the name of the state. But then the other dimension of it is things that are fuzzy as between who actually issued it. Um, in the case of incorporation by reference, somebody else issued it, but it was expressly incorporated by the government. So therefore, the government becomes the author. But as you know, uh, with the issue we're facing now with jury instructions is the jury instructions sometimes are issued through a quasi government, quasi private body. There's all kinds of variation state to state. Even the private bodies are often made up of active duty judges who are basically doing their jobs as judges. They're not just some sort of volunteer out there. So in that case too, we are arguing that because active duty judges are preparing work, jury instructions that relate to the law, which they then will deal with in their jobs as judges, that that too should be considered an edict of government, meaning we should be able to post the jury instructions and the state shouldn't be able to complain about it. But as you know, the problem is a lot of states have cozy relationships with private legal publishers, West, Lexis, and others, and they feel that these, these arrangements work. They get the work done for them, the formatting, the processing, some of the uh, intellectual capital into some of the work around it. So they don't wanna rock the boat, some states, and certainly the legal publishers enjoy having monopoly on these uh, uh, materials that's basically conferred to them through this cozy relationship with the state. So they do the work for free, but they get an exclusive license to sell the work on whatever price and format and terms they want. Um, so let's talk about the state action doctrine. We believe that the state and the vendors are, are deceiving consumers because they're asserting copyright. And after the Georgia case, it's pretty clear that that's inappropriate and potentially behaving in anti-competitive behavior. Uh, we've approached the Federal Trade Commission and asked them to take action. And we've asserted that the state actively supervises this enterprise. It isn't like the vendors are making up the jury instructions. They are being written by judges or, or the codes are being written by legislators. Uh, so explain the state action doctrine to us. In its classic formulation, the state action doctrine shields some kinds of anti-competitive behavior from federal antitrust action. Uh, 
if the conduct involves the state actively supervising that conduct and is in furtherance of some kind of clearly articulated policy from the state. And in such circumstances, such as the petition or the document that we filed with the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC might say that all it can really do is ask, is advise. It cannot sue. It cannot take action. So if the FTC decided in the case of the um, these arrangements with the states that the state action doc- doctrine was relevant, it might be harder to get the FTC to act. But we don't think it applies here. So it's it's sort of a corner case, right? The state action doctrine says if the state is actively supervising the policy, they are immune, uh, certainly from the Sherman Antitrust Act and presumably possibly uh, under the Federal Trade Commission authorization. And the states are actively supervising these codes on the one hand. Yet on the other hand, the vendors uh, have full freedom to determine um, the price, which may be very high, $1,000 in the case of a jury instruction. And 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 the format, uh, you cannot purchase a PDF of the California Electrical Code, for example. It was only available in print. Uh, and and the terms of use. So if you want the official code of Georgia annotated, the only place you can um, get a current version is on Lexus Advance. Um, and you're not allowed to download it um, because the terms of use and technical measures uh, prohibit it. Um, so does the state action doctrine apply here or can you bifurcate it? Can you separate uh, the actions of creating the law and then um, and then selling it. I, th- I think that's right. The state is supervising the substance of what the product is. But in terms of the commerce and the anti-competitive behavior and the relationships with customers, it's all about the vendor. They're free to set prices, create bundles and the conditions under which you can purchase things, regulate payroll, paywalls and terms of use. So to me, That is the behavior we're complaining about. We're not complaining about the text. We're not complaining about the product. We're complaining about how it is sold to the public. And the the submission that we made to the Federal Trade Commission is full of powerful testimony from law librarians and potential competitors and others explaining how this is sort of classic monopoly behavior. Yes, it derives from their access to the state and the state granting them essentially this kind of monopoly. But all of the behavior we're complaining of, as I said, is private behavior. So that would that is the argument we will make as hard as we can. We can't force the Federal Trade Commission to take action and we can't we can't sue um, or we're not at this point considering that. Um, and, and it seems to me that we ought to, the FTC ought to hear us out on that and take a really hard look at whether this state action doctrine really would apply. So far, and um, I, I want to be charitable to the Federal Trade Commission. We, we've had a number of meetings with some uh, very senior officials. They've given us their time. They've been very generous. They've read the briefs. Um, but they've come back to us and they've said, listen, there are three things the Federal Trade Commission does. Um, we enforce consumer protection laws. We enforce antitrust laws and we have an advocacy role. Uh, We are able to give opinions if a question is asked. We can't do anti-competitive enforcement or consumer protection enforcement. But if a member of a legislature or a government official has a question about a specific bill that concerns edicts of government, for example, the Federal Trade Commission can issue an advisory opinion. So what we're hearing is that we, um, law librarians, myself, we don't have standing because we are not a state official. Well, we haven't heard definitively from the FTC. We've had a lot of discussions. There's been a lot of suggestions back and forth, but that the, the debate is still ongoing. And they certainly there's no there's certainly no definitive thing I've heard from anyone there that they think the state action doctrine is dispositive of this claim. The issue is we may not have standing to pose the question. I see. 
I see. So, uh, sovereign immunity, the 11th Amendment, we can't sue states, right? If a state does something that is illegal or, or wrong and violates a Supreme Court opinion, we can't sue. We can't sue them in their own courts. We can sue them if, we, if there are federal causes of action in federal court, but I don't know what those would be. Okay. This brings me to our third constitutional law topic. Uh, what if the federal government simply required that all edicts of government be deposited with the federal government, which would make them available in bulk? Uh, would federalism prohibit the federal government from saying you can put whatever you want in the OCGA? You can print it on parchment, but once you've issued the edict, you must uh, send us a copy and we're going to make it available to the public. Would federalism prohibit this? I don't think so. And, you know, in fact, I'm just going to be quoting back some great research that you did on this. I think there are a number of grounds that would suggest that the federal government should be able to demand from states their laws whether it's Commerce Clause or, as you pointed out, I think a very smart argument, you have the full faith and credit clause, not a very uh, heavily uh, studied part of the U.S. Constitution. But what it said, it has two sentences. The first sentence says that each state shall give each other state's laws full faith and credit, meaning if I have a, a, a judgment from the state of Alabama, the state of Mississippi shouldn't reopen it. They should treat it like it's a judgment of their own state. Now, that's not an absolute thing, but that's part of it. But the second sentence is quite wonderful, and I will read it because I brought it with me to this podcast. And the Congress made by general laws prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved and the effect thereof. That, I think, may be fairly read to say that the Congress, in order to get a handle on all these state laws, um, should, may require the states to provide them and, and, and then would have the power to make those things available to the public. And I think a literal reading of those words compels the conclusion that Congress can do that and that Congress should do that. Because right now, if you are a citizen or a resident or, or anybody else interested in the laws of the United States, you got to go to a million different websites with a million different formats um, to track down the law. It's, it's why in a country where we have so many resources and where we have an internet that is brilliantly capable of giving us a way to look at all the laws, to compare laws, to quickly access provisions of each state, each uh, locality. Why in the world is everything just such a mess? And a modest investment, as you've suggested from the federal government, could fix all this, but you will come again, up against the venality of states and their private uh, partners that don't want the laws uh, freed from paywalls because they like the idea that 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 the state and the company benefit from charging people for access to the law. So you think we could argue that the founding fathers had bulk access on the internet, the, uh, the API, uh, XML and JSON formatted laws in mind when they wrote the full faith and credit clause? They, yes. <laughs> yes and no. They, first of all, I think that they did, you know, you could argue that this provision meant that the federal government should know, should be able to know what the states are up to, to basically get an inventory of what's out there so that states may, you know, would be aware of and compelled to respect the laws of, of the, the other states. But I also think, as many judges think, that we are entitled to read a provision that while the language may not contemplate the internet or uh, space travel or other things that weren't around when the constitution was prepared, and 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 ratified um the words themselves have a timelessness and if the words themselves can be susceptible or or are uh seem to state a principle then that's what the judges should do not say well 
you know, there, there was no space travel in 1789 and therefore we can't apply uh, equal protection of the laws to space travel. Timelessness the constitution means principles matter. And this is a principle that seems very fundamental to our democracy that people should have access to the laws that govern them. And that's what public resource is about. That's what your much of your life's work is about. And that's what we're trying to uphold here. But unfortunately, we do face what I would describe as venality. We just, we face basically a massive resistance to the Supreme Court's decision in, in Georgia versus public resource, where, they, where state after state is refusing, claiming somehow that there's a difference between what they were doing, including Georgia, saying, well, now we're doing something a little different. So the, the case doesn't apply. They are resisting a, a, a decision that is premised on fundamental liberties and fundamental principles of our country in a way that's entirely inappropriate. They are thinking as little, you know, fiefdoms and, and little cozy relationships between state legislators and agencies and some private companies that work well in terms of everybody going out to dinner or, or, or uh, you know, the government saving a little money on producing the law. And they're, they are neglecting their fundamental duty to the citizenry to make the law available. Well, there you have it. We've been um, talking to David Halpern, who is of Council to Public Resource, and this has been your primer on constitutional law. Thank you, David. Thanks for having me, Carl. Always good to see you. Our work at Public Resource is made possible by a generous grant from Arcadia. Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin.